Hello and welcome to today's uh, ICRS Winklet series on the wonderful world of cartilage regeneration. We are here with uh, a lot of experts from all over the world and we have an educational series today and we will talk about cells, signals and scaffolds and orthobiologics. My name is Silvia Nürnberger, I am from the Medical University of Vienna and I'm here with Magali. Okay. Thank you, Silvia. Thank you, Silvia. My name is Magali Guccarini. I'm from the University of Saarland in Germany. And uh, welcome, everybody. We have a great program. We are in the beautiful city of uh, Munich. And uh, we are going first to make uh, our first uh, transition. Uh, we are going to start with the live voting. And uh, please, uh, everybody who is uh, online with us today, uh, read the question and make your choice. What do you think is the most effective autobiological approach for joint preservation? And uh, for this, we have an expert here with us, Laura De Girolamo from uh, Milano, Galeazzi Orthopedic Institute. And she will give us some information, very important information. She's an expert on soluble orthobiologics, what is experimentally feasible and available. Laura, the place is yours. Hi everyone, it's my great pleasure to give this talk for the ICRS TV Series 2023 on this very interesting uh, topic, which is the uh, experimentally um, available soluble orthobiologics. My name is uh, Laura De Girolamo. I'm from Milan, from the Galeazzi Sant'Ambrogio Hospital, and I've been searching uh, uh, in regenerative medicine for 15 years. These are my disclosure. So when I was assigned this title, I thought that it would have been impossible to mention all the innovative approaches uh, in terms of soluble orthobiologics uh, in such a short time. So I decided to focus on MSEs. And in particular, to their uh, main mechanism of action, which, which is their ability to release molecule, molecules that are secreted by MSEs themselves. And this is called paracrine activity because these molecules interact with the um, uh, target cells with the cells where of the tissue where the MSCs are used. So instead of using the old cells, we could uh, use only what they secrete, which is called secretome, which is the uh, actually uh, a combo of soluble proteins and extracellular vesicles. Uh, extracellular vesicles are lipid-bound vesicles secreted by cells into the extracellular space, and they can be divided into microvesicles, exosome, and apoptotic bodies. They differ in terms of biogenesis, pathway release, uh, size, and cargo. And when we go to cargo, uh, it, it actually uh, is the content of microvesicles, and it's made of uh, lipids and proteins, but mainly by nucleic acid, and in particular by microRNA, which are small, short, uh, RN non-coding uh, sequences of RNA. Uh, both in vitro and in vivo study uh, for joint diseases show that MSCs can have a potential in this pathology because they are able to induce the uh, chondrocyte migration and proliferation, modulate the development of cartilage, improve the synthesis of GAGs, but at the same time, they can decrease joint destruction and downregulate the concentration of um, pro-inflammatory uh, molecules. Not only MSCs as extracellular vesicles, but also platelet does. So um, these two uh, studies, it has been shown that uh, uh, extracellular vesicles from PRP were able to inhibit the apoptosis and the hypertrophy of chondrocyte in this model of uh, subtalar osteoarthritis, as well as very interesting that the therapeutic effect of uh, uh, extracellular vesicle derived from PRP on osteoarthritis uh, was very similar or even better compared with those of activated PRP in vitro or in vivo. I mentioned already about microRNAs, so they are uh, actually uh, being associated to a reduction of extracellular matrix degradation, chondrocyte apoptosis and inflammation, and at the same time, increase of chondrocytes proliferation. So also microRNAs are uh, the potential target for improving uh, the um, our um, therapeutics uh, for joint diseases. And several microRNAs have been uh, found in uh, extracellular vesicle from MSCs of different origin, for example, bone marrow, uh, amniotic fluid, amniotic membrane, sorry, adipose derived stem cells, but also from uh, microfermenti adipose tissue. And this micro can have either a pro uh, chondro, chondro so a traffic effect or an anti-inflammatory effect because they actually uh, favor the shift of the um, phenotype M2 uh, 
of macrophages to M1, sorry, from M1 to M2, so from a pro-inflammatory phenotype to an anti-inflammatory phenotype. So to concluding, uh, the research on next-generation soluble orthobiologics is ongoing and is very active. Uh, secretome, extracellular vesicle, and exosomes are, are the most studies and seems the most promising one. Uh, of course, there are several advantages and disadvantages uh, uh, if we look at these, these techniques. So the secretome, extracellular vesicle compared to expanded cells or cell-based products uh, prepared at the point of care. Uh, but more importantly, and this is what we are doing and what we will uh, keep doing in the future, is to focus on the efficacy of these three uh, because at the end, what we need is something which is really effective for our patients. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Laura, for this uh, expert uh, presentation from the experimental point of view. And now we will have a follow-up from uh, Shane Shapiro uh, from Mayo Clinic Jacksonville on soluble orthobiologics, the clinical reality. Thank you, Shane. Hello there, everyone. I'm Shane Shapiro, and I'm going to present Injectable Orthobiologics, the clinical reality in 2024. We all know that we have many options for injectable cell therapies to treat orthopedic problems. Many of these are available as same-day, same-patient procedures, and others are making their way through the pipeline as pharmaceutical manufacturers sell therapies that we're looking forward to seeing those as they reach the market. Unfortunately, the cost to bring such therapies to market is quite expensive. And for that reason, we just don't have many of those today. So currently, our autologous therapies made from patients' own bone marrow, patients' own fat tissues, and also venous whole blood. A regenerative medicine roadmap will then include traditional surgical innovation mixed with the novel drug discovery pathways. And if we can combine these two modalities, we have a path forward to bring new musculoskeletal treatments for conditions like arthritis and tendinopathy. When reviewing the evidence and making recommendations to our patients, we want to use the best evidence available to us. And that usually means systematic reviews and randomized control trials when available. We've had platelet-rich plasma for tendinitis for over 20 years at this point and have numerous studies available. Some of these are positive, some of them not showing a significant difference or positive effect. And yet, when you look at the highest quality studies in a meta-analysis, you are able to combine treatments in over 1,000 patients. And you see that platelet-rich plasma to treat tendinopathies provides patients with a meaningful, clinically important difference that is supported over controls and that can be controls as corticosteroid injections, saline injections, or even physical therapy and shockwave. Platelet-rich plasma added as an adjunct to rotator cuff surgery. Rotator cuff repair shows significantly decreased rates of incomplete tendon healing and also a decrease in pain levels. We know that platelet-rich plasma improves functional outcomes as well when combined with surgery. So, it's a very good option for our patients. How about for arthritis? Well, the first randomized controlled trial was published well over 10 years ago at this point. Since that time, we have 30-40 additional ARCSEs. Several meta-analyses exist that show platelet-rich plasma is superior to saline at almost all time points. It equals hyaluronic acid at the 6-month mark, and it's superior to hyaluronic acid at the 12-month mark. Unfortunately, However, the improvement is still only partial improvement. We have not been effective at curing osteoarthritis, only treating osteoarthritis with platelet-rich plasma, and the level of evidence is still quite low when you look at these meta-analyses. That has to do with the heterogeneity of the products that are being used to treat in the studies, and also the heterogeneity in the studies themselves. Nevertheless, Platelet-rich plasma has been called on on a number of occasions at this point to be included in the standard of care for injectable therapies to treat osteoarthritis, and I think at this point certainly has been utilized that way. Does it need to be leukocyte-rich or leukocyte-poor? Not exactly the most recent double-blinded randomized control trial showed a positive effect the PRP to treat NEOA, and it did not matter whether or not that was leukocyte-rich or leukocyte-poor does have to be on a mild to moderate arthritis, perhaps not. 
Even in moderate to severe arthritis, we have the European League Against Rheumatism with the consensus that PRP can still be used to treat severe NEOA with Kelgren Lawrence. How about PRP in other joints? Well, it seems to be reasonably effective in the hip. But there's a modest risk of bias when you look at all the trials that have been performed. There are two meta-analyses out there. And unfortunately, the effects are short-lived. It's very similar to corticosteroids. So reasonable to use PRP in hip OA, it's just not going to provide patients with much sustained relief. And then many of us may be aware that in the ankle in the Achilles tendon and in some of the other studies, PRP did not have a significant effect, and so still debatable, and PRP certainly has its detractors. For that reason, we're on the hunt for better therapies, bone marrow aspiration, and concentration. Similar to PRP is made by density gradient centrifugation and adds very similar growth factors and cytokines that may also can contain a more cellular cocktail with immunomodulatory and anti-inflammatory properties that may make it superior to PRP. In general, BMAC has been found to be safe and can be somewhat effective as well, but unfortunately, it has not yet been shown to be superior to any other therapies that has been compared to. So, eight studies have been conducted. There have been clinical and functional improvements, but head-to-head -head comparison has failed shows superiority. Hot off the press is the most recent comparison of cell-based therapies to corticosteroid injection, performed as a multi-center trial with 480 patients across four academic medical centers. And as you can see on the right here, the effects were really quite similar whether you use BMAC stromal vascular fraction, corticosteroid, or even umbilical cord blood. BMAC, however, has been shown to be quite effective when treating a vascular necrosis of the femoral head. This is usually used in conjunction with a core decompression, and we now have studies that have looked at over 2,000 treated hips. If you catch it pre-collapse, stage 1 or 2, the core decompression combined with BMAC provides excellent outcomes with stability for those pre-collapse patients in preventing further collapse that leads to hip replacement. Of course, there are opportunities to utilize other therapies. There are a number of 510K clear devices on the market, at least in the United States, that allow us to harvest patients' own adipose tissue and process it mechanically for use in orthopedic medicine and orthopedic surgery. Early trials have been reasonable in terms of their outcomes. So this is microfragmented adipose tissue and a prospective randomized control follow-up. We have good outcomes compared to platelet-rich plasma. T. There is some promising preclinical data when it comes to utilizing the perinatal products. Amniotic suspension allograft has been studied in a couple of our keys. No product has yet been approved for use in the United States by USFDA. And therefore, we still need further studies, which are ongoing. So, if I bring you back to this chart that I started with in the beginning, we look forward to many options. We don't have enough evidence to recommend one orthobiologic product over another just yet. And for that reason, when it comes to recommending orthobiologics, the injectables for our patients, we're using the best available scientific evidence. We're combining that with our clinical expertise and patient preferences. Ultimately, the best evidence is for platelet-rich plasma to treat NEOA and others, hopefully soon to follow with more robust evidence as needed. I thank you guys for attending tonight. I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Shane, for this excellent presentation. And I think, Sylvia, now we are going to pass to the results voting to see what our audience has answered or what is the preference about the most effective autobiologic approach for joint preservation. And from what we see, we have a large majority for whole cells. Secretum then, and uh, followed by exosome, extracellular, vesicles. So I would like to open this discussion with Sylvia and our experts who are here present with us, uh, and especially with uh, Laura, uh, who would maybe say some words about what she would think uh, if this percentage, if these results are uh, what she would expect from her point of view, from her expert point of view. Uh, yes, actually, yes, I expected something like that. And uh, these um, answers uh, actually also uh, resemble what I personally think. And uh, uh, in, uh, in my lab, in my research activity, we are both searching on the efficacy of the whole cells 
as well as the secretum. And we are, of course, analyzing uh, uh, vesicles and microRNAs because they are the effectors of the um, of these uh, uh, treatments. But uh, I think all cells uh, somehow, maybe because I'm a cell biologist, so I'm a little bit biased, but I think that cells still have some, uh, um, you know, very um, important features, which is their adaptability. So when we are, uh, it's true that we can prime cells and we can uh, instruct cells to release what we want. But once we inject the possible secretome within a joint, for example, then the effect is from those molecules and nothing can change them. And cells mm -hmm. still actually um, possess this ability to sense the environment and to adapt to the uh, joint uh, environment. So I think this is one of the main uh, feature that would um, should make us prefer cells over other uh, cell-free approaches. But of course, uh, on the other way, on the other hand, um, cell-free approaches can be somehow, maybe in the future, not yet uh, more practical because we can have this product like an off-the-shelf product. So this is, of course, something which is very relevant for the uh, clinical practice and for the, you know, uh, practitioners. So... Thank That's you. My, my, thank my you very much. Here. Thank you very much, Laura. And uh, thank yeah. you. And I think also another point is the variability, and we have heard that very much. Uh, thank you. And now I think it's time to transition to the next uh, topic, which is cells. And I pass the, the word to Sylvia. Yeah, we now have the next live voting. There are three questions, and uh, please make your choice for every question. And uh, we continue right away with the next expert, who is Stelion Grandi from the Feinstein Institute for Medical Research uh, in New York. And he will talk about the cells and uh, what is experimentally feasible and also available. Uh, welcome, everyone. And um, I would like to first talk about the cell types commonly used uh, for knee, OA, and osteochondral defects. These are my disclosures. Cells represent the uh, third arm of the regenerative triad. They are important for metabolic output during uh, and organizing uh, cartilage repair and, and anti-inflammatory uh, properties. Uh, our articular cartilage has been studied for many years uh, due to its poor intrinsic capacity of many musculoskeletal tissues, not only cartilage, but combined with the lack of proven treatments for many of these orthopedic conditions, this has led to increasing interest in cell therapy approaches for augmentation of tissue healing. So what are we treating exactly? Whether it's focal versus large versus osteochondral defects, whether we're looking at early OA or degenerative OA will also have an effect on our decision making. Uh, the ideal so, uh, cell, cell uh, source has not been fully uh, identified, but we agree that chondrocytes certainly are at the top of the list, along with bone marrow derived stromal cells, adipose stromal cells, synovial fluids derived stem cells, as well as induced pluripotent stem cells whether they require expansion, uh, autologous or allo, wet, me uh, wet methods for retaining them in situ are important, and the phenotypic state and chondrogenic potential will affect their ability to direct functional tissue formation. Uh, chondrocytes are the only currently FDA-approved cell therapy in the U.S. Uh, for, a, uh, for cartilage repair. ACI was invented in 1994, or at least promoted uh, first in uh, New England Journal. Now it's Macy Matrix Assisted ACI. Uh, culture conditions do play a role in, con in the cartilage phenotype that you can see here that uh, over several passages, uh, they start to de-differentiate. Uh, however, if, if we can maintain the phenotypic uh, ex uh, expression of chondrocytes in culture and then implant them, you can see here in this goat repair model that cells that were uh, uh, labeled with green fluorescent protein as well as uh, double staining with for collagen type 2 show a stable uh, in, in the E panel, an orange uh, identified collagen 2 with the original cells that were uh, implanted. The other uh, material that we use or other cell type are bone marrow derived cells. 
and they're commonly used in procedures like bone marrow aspirate concentrate or BMAC. Uh, how they work is, is of, of still a, an ongoing discussion, but basically they have uh, both immunomodulatory and trophic effects that are important in uh, maintenance of, uh, of uh, and homeostasis of cartilage tissue. The other cell type uh, to be discussed are adipose-derived stem cells. They're a population of progenitor cells in the stromal vascular fraction, or SVF. They likely act through paracrine uh, signaling. Uh, today, the, the regulatory environment does not allow enzymatic digestion, but commercial systems use mechanical agitation to emulsify fat. You can see here in the lipogems uh, uh, literature, how that container uh, has a th input for lipoaspirate. Mechanically, perturb perturbation is accomplished by a, uh, a metal beads, and eventually you have these smaller clusters which can stick around in the knee joint after injection for a period of time, eliciting their immunomodulatory properties. Uh, IPS cells, or induced pluripotent stem cells, were first discovered uh, several years ago in 2006 with the introduction of four transcription factors. Uh, due to the fact that they can be uh, grown in, in production in a consistent manner, they may prove key for production of EVs and exosomes for eventual clinical use. And you can see here that initially the uh, fibroblast becomes an embryonic stem cell and all of the germ, three germ layers uh, ecto, meso, and endo are all uh, able to be uh, differentiated in, in, in uh, culture. Uh, the other cell type are amniotic or perinatal tissues, and they include preparations from amniotic membrane, fluid, placenta, umbilical vein, endothelial cells, and cord blood. Their common use is for NeOA. Uh, whether the cells are viable or not is not really clear, we show very little viable cells in our, um, in our hands. Efficacy is likely to do the anti-inflammatory immunomodulating uh, properties. Uh, stem cells that are derived from uh, synovial fluid represent another potential source of cells that are highly chondrogenic. Uh, allogenic sources are, are important because if we can have an off-the-shelf availability, that would be a, a significant improvement. Uh, recent bone marrow-derived MSC RCTs reported positive outcomes for patients with OA even as early as this year. Uh, and clinicaltrials.gov uh, reports over 200 allogeneic RCTs that are registered, including other things like spine and rotator cuff. So with that, I thank you for uh, your, your attention. Thank you, Danny, for this excellent overview of what is in the research pipeline. And now we directly continue to um, Mats Pritzberg from the University of Gothenburg, and he will report on the clinical reality on the cells. So, ladies and gentlemen, my task is to talk about the cells. Uh, and the cell is the functional basic unit of life. The word cell comes from the Latin cellula, meaning a small room described by Robert Hooke in 1665 when he looked upon cork cells and thought they looked like the room where the monks lived. It's also clear that cells are all us and for all types of repair and tissue integration, cells are needed. And even though we talk about a cellular repairs, even acellular scaffolds, when put into a defect, need an integration uh, uh, via the biomaterial immune system interaction. And when we are to do cartilage repair, we need the chondrocytes because they are the only cells in cartilage uh, producing the matrix. And then we should know that committed chondrocytes outperform mesenchymal stem cell in chondrogenic ability, young chondrocytes outperform old chondrocytes, and cartilage tissue progenitor cells outperform committed chondrocytes. Furthermore, uh, if we looked upon embryonic cartilage production, it's the interzonal cells that aggregate and in a condensate they start to differentiate and finally produce uh, the cartilage lining in the joint formation. 
And this is interesting because when we do cell expansion to do cell culture, the cells did differentiate, but we could redifferentiate them in, in a subcutaneous tissue and in the cartilage uh, position in the scaffold. And also of interest is that this de-differentiated chondrocytes have a similarity to the prechondrogenic cell condensation and cartilage formation. And that can be shown in cell culture where the cells express SOX9, important for condensation, and also uh, WNT, uh, WNT14, critical for joint development. When we look upon cells in culture, uh, MSCs difference, uh, chondrocytes and MSC differentiate and form different subtypes. Uh, so the chondrocytes produce the hyaline one and MSCs uh, the mixed cartilage phenotype. But when we mix chondrocytes with MSCs, we enhance the mechanical properties of the repair tissue uh, uh, extracellular matrix. And we also could see a decrease of the expression of collagen type 10 produced by the MSCs. Uh, to do cell cultures uh, and to do cartilage repair in the future, we should take the cells in the different layers and try uh, to produce uh, the different layers by 3D printing. And then we should prefer allogenic juvenile -like chondrocyte or iPS cells because of scalability, more stable non-age dependent chronogenic cell effect and less costs. If we use IPS cells, we could turn them from fibroblasts into chondrocytes, but more interesting is to turn the chondrocytes into an IPS cell, expand the number of cells, and then, then turn them back to chondrocytes, because then we will have more authentic and functional chondrocytes. So, cartilage repair is depending on the chondrocytes, but also on the chondrocytes uh, collaboration and cross-talking with the surrounding cells. Uh, so, in the final end, um, the chondrocytes is both the conductor and concert pianist, but requires an entire orchestra to carry out the repair to become a final lovely symphony for the joint, a true cartilage. And I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you much for giving us this uh, clinical overview. And um, now we are coming to the results of the voting. And the first voting question was, what cell types hold the best promise for treatment of cartilage defects? And here it was uh, also a quite clear um, result that uh, bone marrow um, cells uh, or MSCs um, would be the best choice over chondrocytes and ASCs, IPS, and synovial fluid stem cells. The next question was, what cell type is best for treatment of knee OA? And here we have MSCs or BMAC, also quite clear results over ASCs and platelets and gene-modified somatic cells. And the third question is, which cells are currently considered the most important actors in osteoarthritis. And there, um, the chondrocytes uh, made the run uh, over macrophages, synoviocytes, osteocytes, and adipocytes. So um, maybe we ask the question first to Danny. Um, the, what do you think about the players, the, the, the chondrocytes as the most important players for OA? I would say that the chondrocytes, while they're very important, uh, they manage their own territorial matrix, whereas the macrophages and the synovium are going to elicit these uh, negative uh, inflammatory cytokines. So I think managing the uh, macrophage phenotype, M1 versus M2, are probably the most important things uh, or the most important cell types to target in uh, OA. That's that's what I would I would uh, venture uh, an opinion on. And Mats, what do you, do you think from the clinical perspective? Would you uh, consider the chondrocytes also as the major players? 
Well, certainly, uh, yes, chondrocytes is the only cell in cartilage. It, it's depending certainly on the surroundings. And as we have heard, the different players in the synovium, in the fat tissue, the MSCs, the macrophages could all, all be in, in collaboration with the chondrocytes, but could also be enemies uh, towards the cartilaginous matrix. So in order to be able to treat at least osteoarthritis, we need to, to get more knowledge about the cross talk between those all those cells and try to to get a friendly uh, situation in the joint uh, with all the cells okay so it's a crosstalk and the chondrocytes are in the center of the interest then we can continue with the next speaker the next speaker uh, so it's uh, Bert Mandelbaum from Cedar Sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles thank you for being present with us and he's going to propose an explanation on traumatic dislocation of the patella with cartilage defect PACI approach thank you Bert This is Pert Benabalm, and I'm going to be speaking over the next few minutes about treating these cartilage defects of the patella using a PACI approach. Now, we're talking about lots of different things, and this is about cells and scaffolds. And we're today going to focus on PACI, not in relationship to anything else, but PACI at this point. We want to talk about this advantage of being single versus two stage with some rationale from the perspective of animal study, and then also ongoing and previous clinical experience and rationale. As we know, we've seen numerous animal studies from mouse to rabbit, to goat to horse that you can see sequencing in these experimental studies on particulated cartilage. Most notable is the CASE procedure where histologic analysis of repair tissue was done in goats at six months and horses. You can see here using the Cates procedure, which is minced cartilage plus a scaffold uh, that was uh, biodegradable. And you can see the significant, excellent cartilage fill, in, uh, as you can see in these lower photos. We know Dan Grandy, who is part of this meeting, has shown experimentally in rabbits that there's high tissue viability with minced cartilage. It's highly conserved and morsel size can be controlled by the process. In addition, we can see in comparison to empty defects histology that shows excellent agrican rich regenerated cartilage at the articular surface. Furthermore, we look at collagen 2 and PCNA gene expression is markedly upregulated, as is SOX9, PRG4, and Lubricin as a consequence of this. We look at clinical studies and our study first author, Brian Cole, that we did in looking at the case procedure. And we found with this multi-center study, some very good results in relationship to microfracture. In addition, Ramon Cugart from Barcelona has been very focused and interested in this, both in animal studies, as you can see, cartilage regeneration using novel factors in sheep, as well as in humans showing excellent results going forward. And lastly, when we look at PACI, particulated cartilage for chondral and osteochondral repair review, there's a spectrum of off authors, as we can see from the paper, papers we showed you, Ramon Cugat at the bottom and Brian Cole at the top, that this is an excellent uh, approach and an excellent step to doing a single stage approach using stels and scaffold from autologous cartilage. So thank you very much. It's very happy to be part of this session, and we look forward to further discussion. Thank you very much, Bert, for this excellent presentation again. And now we continue again with you on the case presentation. And uh, please explain us how your case would be, and we will see later how you would treat it and have a discussion with the expert. Thank you. This is Bert Benavon, and I'm presenting a case of a 19-year-old basketball player with right knee pain after a patella dislocation, and he can't play or train. 
gets normal x-rays, normal alignment with a TTGG of 15.3 millimeters. So in surgery, we found that he had this patella cartilage defect that you could see arthroscopically, and this one at the inframedial. Look, you could see it in both different angles. And as a consequence, we took cartilage from the notch as well as part of the fragment, and we minced it, as you can see, and gradually mixed it with PRP as well as performed drilling microfracture of the defect and then mixed it after placing it in the defect with fibrin glue. Here you can see the finished result. At six months postoperatively, you can see the cartilage defects is healed nicely. The concomitant MPFL ligament reconstruction looks good. And the question we have for the group is, what would you do? Thank you. Thank you, Bert, for this uh, excellent presentation. So I would like to ask the expert, what would you do in, the, in this case, for this case, this particular case? And maybe I would like to start with Matt. Matt, would we, what would be your opinion about this particular case that Bert presented? Yes, uh, what uh, Bert presented uh, uh, with his minced cartilage is, is a very good alternative today. Uh, it was quite a large defect, but uh, he managed to, to get enough of, of minced cartilage to fill it up and uh, together with fibrin glue, and he also used PRP. So I think this is an option today. It's, it's an interesting alternative and also the possibility that you could use minced cartilage from juvenile uh, donors, which means that you will have a good quality. Now, even if you have a large defect and you don't have enough of autologous uh, minced cartilage, you could mix minced autologous cartilage with juvenile cartilage and that will boost the effect. So this is certainly an interesting alternative for this type of lesions. Thank you, Matt. I see Henning also. Maybe Henning, you would like to add your expert opinion about this case. Well, how would you Treat it. What would you do? So first of all, hello to everybody. It's good to see you, <laughs> even though not live. Um, well, I think the number one treatment option, uh, in my opinion, would be an, uh, a, a matrix-associated chondrocyte implantation as the defect is so large. But as this is not available everywhere, I, I would agree in making a particulated uh, uh, cartilage procedure because I think that you need uh, some kind, some type of chondrocytes uh, to cover such a large lesion and to, to tell the MSCs that somehow will migrate into that lesion that they should differentiate into chondrocytes. Thank you, Henning. Sylvia, I think you wanted also to add a question or point. Yeah, I have um, a question to um, Danny. Um, about uh, the ASCs or more for the fat dairy weights for the stromal vascular fractions. Um, since it's a heterogeneous population of cells inside the stromal vascular fraction, um, what do you think is the function of the other cells um, to the regeneration process? So the um, um, endothelial cells, macrophages, um, and so on. You asked me that, correct? Yes. Yes. So uh, the adipose derived stem cells, I think the primary function in vivo is anti inflammatory uh, and immunomodulatory. So, um, yeah, so I would consider that as the primary function. I would also suggest, or although I'm not a clinician, why not at Bert and, and Matt's? Uh, why not incorporate BMAC as well as the minced cartilage in such a defect to kind of jumpstart that or even lipoaspirate combined with minced cartilage? Maybe you can comment on that. I would be a little afraid uh, uh, mixing the, the bone marrow cells there because then, you know, a problem in, in cartilage repair is in group of bone. Uh, so then uh, your cartilage repair area will be thinner and thinner and the patient will start their pain. So 
<laughs> so, bone marrow uh, cells or BMAC in the in an orthochondral defect in the con in the bony area, <laughs> the minced cartilage in the cartilaginous area, but not mix them. You know, Dan, I, I I've been impressed with the work of uh, Rita Candell, um, who really has shown the upregulation. Uh, target expression of uh, ACAN and collagen 2, as well as improvement in mechanical properties in her cartilage uh, model. You know, one of the reasons in response to Henning, um, his comments, was in our, in our country, we, we've had difficulty getting uh, Macy approved. And um, what's happened to us is that we've had a number of cases that we didn't get approved, and we went on to do this minced cartilage technique uh, autologously. And in following our patients, we found that they were doing better when we were using advanced MRI techniques. The cartilage repair looked better than the Macy techniques that we saw previously. So a single stage procedure, less expense, and in reality, morphologically on MRI and also on our scores, we're performing better than the matrix associated procedures. So I think we have something here. And I think it's evolving, and uh, we need to continue to develop larger numbers at, at this going forward. That's uh, that's that's very interesting uh, what you just said, and I believe uh, that there is uh, some 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 strong evidence from from animal study for the for the minced uh, cartilage techniques. Um, I think, and this is something that we could discuss uh, where the future will be, whether we will. Uh, whether whether healthcare systems will still be al allowing themselves to uh, to isolate chondrocytes, and the other question would be, um, what is actually uh, the the mode of action of minced cartilage? Is it that the chondrocytes that are clearly viable, will they proliferate and fill the defect? Will they also secrete paracrine factors? Yeah. Will the cartilage matrix play a role in directing chondrogenesis. I think these are all exciting questions and they, they will be answered in uh, in the future, I'm sure, in, 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 uh, in uh, randomized controlled trials, uh, similar as they have been done with, with ACI to tell us whether it's truly superior or comparable to ACI. What we've seen so far is that we, at certain sizes and, and, and uh, you know, different dimensions of the minced cartilage. We've optimized a, uh, a a rapid outgrowth of chondrocytes from those so from those particles from those those pieces. So I think that's the you know that's the primary mechanism by which we see the repair. However, re with regards to um, what they secrete and whether there's paracrine uh, factors involved or signaling in that regard. It's not really clear at this time. I mean, that that's going to require some more more work, certainly. But uh, that's a good point, and I think it's worth it, certainly exploring. Thank you to all the experts. Now it's time to transition uh, to the partner session, Regen Lab, hybrid therapy in osteoarthritis with cellular matrix. Stay tuned. We are back at 5.55. And thank you for this active discussion. And we see here with Sylvia that there are plenty of questions that, that need more answers, and uh, the discussion was very active. Thank you. Welcome back for the second part of our wonderful world of cartilage regeneration and joint preservation. We start again with a, a new uh, row of questions. I think it's going to appear very soon, live voting, for the new topic, which is this time scaffold. So please, uh, everybody online, check and uh, cross from A to E, promoting scaffold concept for cartilage regeneration are in the research pipeline. Which of the following properties matters the most to you? Please answer. And uh, we transition now with uh, Marcus Momme from the University Children's Hospital in Basel, who's going to present a clinical translation in cartilage repair using combined scaffold and cell-based functional cartilage tissue. Please, the podium, the virtual podium is yours.
Here, colleagues, I'm happy to present clinical translation and cartilage repair. Um, I think we all know the importance of cartilage injuries, um, either found incidentally during knee arthroscopy or on MRI. Um, the natural cause of these focal injuries is the progression towards osteoarthritis and important amount of the adult population is suffering from osteoarthritis with um, associated um, pain, functional reduction, reduction and quality of life and healthcare costs. Also, this uh, recent publication in Nature Medicine demonstrated that um, any cell-based injection therapy for osteoarthritis is not superior, superior to corticosteroid injections. So either umbilicals, cord stem cells, fat uh, tissue-derived uh, stromal vascular fraction or um, bone marrow-derived MSCs. So this is quite frustrating. So um, I'd like to present our tissue engineering approach. We take a biopsy from the nasal septum cartilage, which is also a highline cartilage. We um, isolate the cells um, and expand them. And then these cells are seeded on our um, scaffold, a collagen scaffold, chondrogyte. Um, and um, these um, cells are seeded and ex um, in, um, cultured in vivo in 3D. And after one month of production time, we receive um, such a cartilage tissue. You can see it here in the video as I handle it in the OR. You can punch it, cut it, shape it to defect size. I'd like to highlight the main novelty of this. So in the um, um, known therapies of chondrocyte transplantation, you have normally expanded cells, which are implanted um, within a biomaterial. The really difference in our graft is that we really culture a three-dimensional cartilaginous tissue. You can see it here on the right-hand side. Um, you see the chondrocytes, which already um, differentiated into chondrogenic phenotype with an abundant cartilaginous matrix. We tested in um, preclinical um, all the different aspects, mechanical aspects. These cells start to increase lubricine and hyaluronic acid um, production when they are um, opposed to weight bearing. They are quite resilient to inflammatory um, um, environment and they can adapt to um, articular genotype. Um, and also in preclinical studies, we demonstrated um, superiority of these cells if compared to articular chondrocytes. We also performed phase one study demonstrating the safety of this approach and now stopped um, or finalized the phase two study demonstrating superiority of a premature cartilaginous tissue if compared to implanting the nasal contraceptive just as cells on a membrane. And um, even um, for revision surgeries, we've seen an um, important clinical benefit for the patients with an improvement in the Q scores of almost 40 points, which is quite um, promising. We're now going to more challenging indications. Um, here mentioned the patellofemoral osteoarthritis, which is an important subtype of um, knee osteoarthritis. And the main problem is the biomechanical problems, but also the um, standard kissing lesions of um, this disease. So we see, we, we are um, challenged with um, cartilage damage on the kneecap and on the trochlea of the femur. I'd like to show um, um intraoperative photos from the first surgery. Here you see the important cartilage damage and you see the implanted graft. Here you see the preoperative MRI with the severe cartilage damage and bone marrow edema. And uh, one year postoperatively, you see nicely regenerated cartilage behind the kneecap and the bone marrow edema count fully down. These are the clinical scores. In, of the first two patients, we have one year follow up, and their um, clinical scores improved importantly. So, with um, um, on course, almost 90 points after one year. Based on this, we um, are starting randomized multi center trials um, across Europe and um, to test this um, treatment approach towards standard comparator like PRP injections or um, patellofemoral osteoarthritis. I'd like to um, summarize um, the um, nasal cartilage approach is feasible and we demonstrated preliminary efficacy. We're now going into phase two randomized multicenter trials to um, prove um, the efficacy um, if um, compared to standard comparators and in the future um, ad um, addition with um, um, osteochondral scaffold will even give us more opportunities to treat osteoarthritis. Thank you for your attention.
Thank you, Marcus, very much for this presentation on nose to knee trials. Very exciting uh, presentation. And we continue on this topic three, and I would like to transition with my, my friend and colleague, Sylvia, who's here live on the scaffold. Please, Sylvia. Thank you, Magali. So um, I want to talk about the scaffolds and what's currently in the pipeline. So scaffolds are biomaterials which have the minimal requirement of distributing the cells in the defect, but they should also guide, protect and stimulate them. What's currently used in clinics um, are still mainly the materials which have been used also at the beginning of the century or uh, similar versions of that, even though in uh, more different types of settings also with other cells. So we know, though, from these very first studies that um, our, over long term we cannot completely avoid osteoarthritis, but just uh, prolong the onset. So the biomaterials uh, that uh, have been used and that are on the market are mainly fleeces, sponges, hydrogels, and um, also newer scaffolds have the same principle. But there are also new concepts like coral plaques or uh, multilayered <laughs> biomaterial. So we do not know so far um, if they um, lead to a better outcome. But uh, in the meantime, we need to think if we somehow can improve uh, the biomaterials with other concepts. And so we have to remind ourselves about the principle of uh, cartilage, which is uh, the um, defined structure, the composition, and its high load-bearing capacity. And what we now need to improve is uh, the quality of the material. And to make really a, a, an almost hyaline cartilage, a hyaline cartilage with the appropriate architecture of the collagen. To achieve that, there are a lot of different strategies out for the novo generation of uh, scaffold materials like bioprinting, electrospinning, or, <clears throat> or um, casting methods. But there are also very pragmatic uh, methods of using um, cartilage itself um, as a kind of uh, recycled waste material. For the de novo strategies, there are a lot of different uh, um, concepts uh, of fibers um, and webs and so on. And I want to highlight two particularly, which is uh, this one where small chambers were generated uh, and uh, spheroids were implanted. And uh, here it could be shown that the small chambers um, uh, um, serve as a guidance for the the position of the new matrix. So there, there is already a physiological alignment of the collagen, at least in some parts. And another study uses a cartilage from different origin. And uh, articular cartilage uh, sponges led to chondrogenicity. And growth plate cartilage um, sponges led to osteogenicity. And this already shows that the, the cartilage matrix has a very high potential. And um, therefore, we thought that uh, why not uh, using cartilage uh, itself as a material, desaturize it, and make it more porous for resaturization. And this is what we have done with laser strategies. And what we saw that uh, in these laser incisions, uh, the newly formed material also had the physiologically appropriate alignment of the collagen fibers, and it served uh, as a good environment for chondrogenicity, because what you see here uh, is the differentiation of elderly chondrocytes without any addition of growth factors. Another strategy was to remove elastic fibers of auricular cartilage and uh, use these uh, remaining channels uh, to let the cells grow in. And uh, also here inside the channels, there was a good differentiation and also the alignment of collagen fibrils in the physiological right direction. Yeah, and we do not know if we found the holy grail yet, grail yet because uh, we need to wait uh, for long-term um, clinical studies to answer these questions. But in principle, there are strategies uh, like the novo generation of uh, scaffold material or recycling material the endogenous uh, synthesis of newly formed matrix or the implantation of uh, a bunch of matrix, or there is also the question if one fits all applies or we have to individualize it to the um, location of the defect and also to the patient. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Sylvia, for this uh, nice overview on a very important topic, broad, that everybody here is interested and also in the audience. Now let's look at the results of the voting, uh, promising scaffold concept for cartilage regeneration. Well, first, with a large majority, both structure and composition need to be optimized and optimal. Growth factors are required, structure of the scaffold is essential. Uh, with the right choice of the cells, the scaffold are irrelevant minority of people and nobody answered on the composition. So what, Sylvia, the, this, is, this, this discussion is open to everybody, but maybe since you have presented us this particular uh, topic and case, what is your opinion or what, are you satisfied with the results? Would you like to comment them? Yes, I'm satisfied with the results uh, because um, um, these uh, are the arguments uh, for the strategy to mm. use really cartilage itself uh, as a biomaterial. And um, this is uh, a bit a disadvantage of the existing materials because mm -hmm. they're uh, very soft, they're frequently on, 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 on non-collagen, um, not cartilage, high mm -hmm. cartilage components. Mm -hmm. And um, they also do not have the appropriate structure, which we consider is very important because they guide the matrix deposition of the mm -hmm. cells and only like that, mm -hmm. uh, finally appropriate uh, matrix, and this is the main part of the cartilage, mm -hmm can develop and um, this is maybe the, 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 the answer for better long-term stability of the material. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I would like to ask Daniel also to reach out to you. Daniel, what is your opinion? What do you think of the results? And what uh, Sylvia just answered to us? Uh, I, I agree with her. I think that that's exactly what we should be hoping for or looking for in our, our matrices. Uh, I, I agree with her 100%. I could also, if you don't mind, if I could ask Marcus about his talk, um, the, the, is um, the cartilage from the nasal septum exactly the same as cartilage from, or, or the chondrocytes the same as uh, in the knee or, or the hip for that matter. And uh, ha and what's the advantage of using that over obtaining uh, cartilage from the knee for your, your studies other than is it primarily uh, due to um, the fact that you don't want to, you know, rob Peter to pay Paul kind of situation? Uh, can you comment on that, if you don't mind? Thank you, Daniel, this question. This is a good question. The nasal septal cartilage is also a highline cartilage. So it's a um, historic entity. Of course, it's not exactly the same. So we even see differences between ankle, shoulder, and elbow cartilage. So th th there is um, already a difference. But in our studies, we've seen that the cartilage can adapt to the um, articular environment. It can adapt to the um, surroundings. Uh, I would like uh, maybe to ask a question. Can can uh, uh, lab? I see the... you are here. Would you like to comment on that also from a clinical point of view? Well, yeah, I think the work that we just saw was quite interesting, and I'm uh, very impressed with it. However, I would also say that when, what we have found, and I'll show you a case when it's my turn to speak a little bit later, uh, that with our scaffold, uh, we can actually direct the patient's own MSCs uh, to make uh, subchondral bone as well as hyaline cartilage. And uh, so the work that we, we won't have time to present at all today, but if, um, if you look at the work that's been published on the Aragonite Agile C scaffold that uh, was just mentioned in the last talk, you'll see that both in the animal and human studies, we get a very good subchondral bone reconstitution. It turns out that aragonite, which is sea coral, is very similar uh, on the under the electron microscope to bone. It's got the same porosity, which allows vascularization and ingrowth of MSCs. And on the top third of this scaffold, They've drilled very small holes of a certain diameter that have been shown by several researchers, both in Pittsburgh as well as in Israel, to um, when you take human MSCs and put them in a tube of that diameter, we get uh, we push the cells along the chondrogenic line. So uh, we have found that the scaffold itself can stimulate the body's own repair mechanism. And I think you'll see on the case that we present that it's been um, uh, quite pleasing uh, clinically as well as uh, scientifically. Okay, then we come to our next live voting with the question, do you think the gene therapy will improve cartilage restoration and joint preservation in patients in the future? So make your choice. And um, in the meantime, uh, we continue with my dear co-chair, Megali, and she will talk about uh, signals um, and what is experimental feasible and available. 
Thank you very much, Sylvia. Thank you very much for the presentation. What we would try to do with signals is to try actually to find an easy way, which is maybe an utopy, uh, to have a, a, a therapy. You might not see it very close from here, but what we call signals is what you would see in the syringe, which would be an effective, durable, and safe approach to repair focal defects that could evolve toward osteoarthritic uh, lesions. It's very important to have something safe because we know we don't, uh, osteoarthritis, for instance, is not a lethal disease, and it's also very important that it's uh, durable because we have a, a persistent uh, development of the disorder at different stage, it's irreversible, and so on. Everybody who works in our field knows that. There are different ways of uh, providing a signal to, uh, to a, a cartilage defect, a lesion. Uh, the easiest and maybe the pioneering work was using uh, recombinant factors. They were available, they were produced uh, very simply, but we have all to keep in, uh, into, uh, in mind that these signals are from a recombinant form, most of the time proteins, they can be growth factors, they can be other kinds of, of uh, molecules. Uh, they have a short alpha, um, pharmacological half-life. So it's very important for uh, a durable uh, therapy to go in the direction of sustained, but also safe uh, approach, therapeutic approach. And that's where gene therapy comes uh, into question. Uh, what is gene therapy? Uh, it enters a lot of decades of work. We had up and downs in the field. We have several people uh, worldwide working in with this approach. It's the transfer of therapeutic genetic sequences to treat human disorders, in particular for the cartilage. And it can be gene marking, correction, augmentation, etc. Et uh, it can be based on the, the transfer of DNA molecules or also, and it's more emerging, on RNA uh, molecules. Uh, it, genome editing is also a point uh, which is part of gene therapy. You have heard that uh, there was a Nobel Prize in 2020 on CRISPR-Cas9, which is a direct modification of, of the human genome. We know also that now another Nobel Prize that I want to, to, to mention this year, uh, RNA, modified RNA gene therapy, which has been used for the COVID vaccine. It's important also to think that these uh, genes or these nucleic acids, maybe gene therapy should be changed. The nucleic acid therapy needs to be provided via vectors, so carriers. And these carriers can be either non-viral or viral vectors. They have all advantages and limitations, I would say that for a durable disorder to be treated, uh, the viral vectors, which have a natural targeting inside the, inside the cell, through the cell membrane, would be very adapted, and especially those based on adeno-associated viral viruses. They are become recombinant, they are small, they are very efficient, they stay episomal, so they don't really integrate, so they are no, normally, they are safe, there are no side effects. And there are a lot of trials. I have listed here some gene therapy clinical trials, and uh, performed in different fields, cancer, cardiology, neurodegenerative disorders, some in our field in orthopedics, and uh, a lot of molecules that have been also uh, employed, or let's say therapies, nucleic acid therapies, which we, we, which we would call advanced therapy medicinal products, or ATMPs. For cartilage specific, the gene therapy, what we want to generate either is to solidify the chondrocyte, uh, uh, we have heard about the cells, the chondrocyte phenotype, but also from the mesenchymal uh, stromal cell point of view, we want to, prove to generate chondrocyte. And for this, we want to go at the early stage of chondrogenesis with different factors. And this in green, you can see that we have different factors that could be used as gene and produce the protein, uh, depending on that, that could be helpful for cartilage. SOX9 is a transcription factor. You can see also different growth factor, IGF1, FGF2. So very early on, we don't want to have ossification obviously. So the strategy is either in the, in the focal defect or for osteoarthritis to either provide a gene vector directly or genetically modified cells. We have herd cells. We can also envisage maybe uh, secretome and EVs or this genetically modified cell, we can provide them in a biomaterial. And this is what we call the classical gene therapy. On the other side, on the right, you can see we can directly use the vectors in a scaffold. And this would be what we call the biomaterial guided gene therapy. So you obtain a composite, you expect to have a controlled release, it's safe, the scaffold could protect the vectors from any immune response or deleterious response in the joint. 
And this some, are some examples of direct gene therapy, classical gene therapy with an AEV SOX9, for instance. Uh, we have used that in a different model from small to large animal models. And I mentioned Henning Madri, who is also here and our expert. Uh, we have, compared to the control treatment, improvement of the cartilage repair. If we use biomaterial guided gene therapy for cartilage, and this is in particular example of an alginate hydrogel with AV coding for IGF-1 in mini pig, when we provide this uh, composite, we have a strong controlled release and a protection of oste or peripheral osteoarthritis around the defects over a year, and the defects also regenerate better or repair better uh, compared to the control. So these are giving us hope that we could go in this direction that we can also combine, again, this nucleic acid therapy with cells, scaffolds, or direct, also with EVs, and this I relate uh, also to, uh, to the nice work that Lara has presented at the beginning, with uh, also bone marrow aspirates and so on, and the scaffold. Still, and this relates maybe to the question that will come, we always have in gene therapy to make a benefit risk assessment, and these are the notes of caution. First, always, uh, ethical approach, ethic, ethical, to keep the ethics in mind. The, also, the cost of the gene therapy, that's very expensive, it can be very expensive. Uh, some uh, products have been re removed from the market, but we on the, on the other side, we see that the COVID mRNA uh, vaccine, is a, it's also a gene therapy, has been used for the world population. CRISPR is still, I think, for OA, that's my personal opinion, a bit problematic because it has been shown to cause uh, genomic damage, so that's uh, not maybe, uh, the best approach for at least OA or focal defects. And uh, we need to keep all that in mind uh, to bring this experimental work inside the clinic. Thank you. Thank you, Magalia. Now we directly continue to um, the clinical part to Henik Metri from the Saarland University Hospital of Hamburg. Yeah, and he will talk about the clinical reality of signals. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm very glad to present a part of the clinical reality for the signal molecules. Um, the clinical reality is, in my opinion, very important to be remembered of the difference between the focal cartilage defects, which are not osteoarthritis, and the possibility that such focal defects might develop if untreated into osteoarthritis, with, which sets the stage of treating these focal defects with the tools that we have available. This slide summarizes those a bit. Um, the major pro points here are to use marrow stimulation for the smaller defects, chondrocyte implantation for the larger defects, and other different techniques, including the use of scaffolds as indicated. Growth factors have been identified and used in animal models as therapeutic signals for articular cartilage repair since about more than 40 years. Um, and these ex initial experiments date back to the year 1980 using fibroblast growth factor two. Much has been done in the following decades and the use of growth factors has culminated in clinical trials for knee osteoarthritis, not for articular cartilage defects, where, for example, fibroblast growth factor 18 has been used in several randomized controlled trials and has provided significant proof that articular cartilage volume can be obtained by intraticular injections of this growth factor protein. The missing gap here is the use of growth factor proteins for articular cartilage repair in a setting of regenerative surgery. We and others have shown that, for example, TGF-beta protein-releasing scaffolds improve both chondrocyte chondrogenesis in vitro and also in vivo. And the approach that we have used in vivo was to add that in a subchondral location with a scaffold which releases such molecules. And we can show in, Arctic, in large animal models that this is also beneficial for cartilage repair. 
FGF18 has been also used in several translational models, ovine, equine, together with microfracture, for example, and as intraticular injection and collagen membrane-based approaches. And histological cartilage repair has been also improved compared to the negative control. The missing gap here, unfortunately, is that there are no clinical data available yet for using growth factor proteins for knee cartilage repair. To conclude, signaling approaches are most likely complementing established techniques in the future. We have promising results in vitro and from preclinical models of knee cartilage defects. We have also promising results of clinical trials in the context of knee osteoarthritis. What is needed in the future is a signaling strategy that is off the shelf, affordable, safe, and of superior efficacy than existing reconstructive therapies that we use at the moment. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Henik, for the clinical perspective. And now we come to the results of the voting. And uh, we see um, a, also a quite clear result that the answer is yes, provided that it is more effective than the current treatments um, and stays affordable, it will be an option to um, use uh, gene therapy in future for cartilage regeneration. So, Magali, are you glad? <laughs> I am. <laughs> there was not a complete rejection of gene therapy, actually. Uh, it seems that uh, having been in the phase of COVID, people have been convinced that uh, yes, uh, provided that yes, absolutely, I, I fully agree. It has to be safe and affordable. We know that uh, some drugs or some nucleic drugs have been uh, removed from the market because they are very expensive. So it's uh, just not affordable and especially for low income countries. So it would be really a, a pity. We, we need to treat everybody. So yes, there is future, but I'm not the only one who is using gene therapy here. So I think we maybe ask Others, or especially clinicians, because we have heard from Henning, yes, no clinical data. It's a, it's a, it's a complicated topic. So maybe we open the discussion to others. Um, I would ask uh, Henning um, if you could comment on, do you think, how long do you think you need to have that signal, that gene expression in, in effect? And do you think that it might require more than one signaling pathway or one signal because as we know in osteoarthritis, sometimes uh, it appears that there's redundancy and, and there's more than one signaling pathway that's key. So with regards to cartilage repair or OA, what is your opinion about that? Yeah, thank you, Daniel, for uh, posing these excellent questions. Um, I think uh, the, the, the issue of uh, how long a growth factor or a gene has to be active and a gene of course would be how long has the gene product to be available i think that is not very long um, if we compare the uh, clinical trials with the fgf18 where we know that the half-life of a protein in a joint is probably a couple of hours uh, less than a day and we see significant effects of uh, cartilage uh, volume growth then we could expect the same in a cartilage defect. In addition, if we use a strategy where such a growth factor may be combined with a scaffold or a gene combined with a scaffold, that's, that's the approach we're working on, where you could really provide it in the place where the new repair tissue grows, that might be even more beneficial. And to the second important point that you made, uh, whether one, one gene or one protein or combination uh, might be better. I think uh, it probably is a is a is a two stage approach. I think I would personally be happy to see uh, one growth factor delivered as a protein or as a gene. Uh, probably a potent one like FGF18, IGF1, maybe TGF beta, and then uh, build on this data uh, and probably use uh, combined strategies. But we all know. It's a, it's a complex undertaking, not only from the a regulatory approach. I will say now that uh, this Ken Zaslav, we, you know, having seen the incredible success of gene therapy with um, 
diseases like sickle cell, uh, you know, just remarkable potential, it seems to me, for the future. It just may be very expensive, but it, it, certainly with time, maybe that would come down. So very exciting, both with viral vectors and CRISPR. A good transition that you ask the question because it's now your turn for your case presentation. Please on scaffold. Kenneth Asla from Northwell Health in New York. Please. Hi, this is Ken Zaslav, and I'll be presenting the next case here on the Winglet presentation. I'm from Lenox Hill Hospital and Northwell Orthopedics in New York, New York. This is a 50-year-old male who has a BMI of 28. He presented with pain, stiffness, and occasional fusions for several years. He had failed cortisone as well as HA injections, as well as physical therapy for over four months. On his x-rays, which you'll see in a moment, he had only KL2 changes, uh, but um, uh, no major joint narrowing. He had two large lesions, uh, one on the trochlea, approximately six cent square centimeters, and a smaller one on the medial premal condyle, 1.5 square centimeters. He also had a degenerative inner third medial meniscus tear. Here's the x-ray on the far left and the MRI on the right, uh, and you can see his lateral joint is in pretty good shape. Uh, but more importantly, here are the uh, arthroscopic views, both the large trochlear lesion taking up um, a large percent of the trochlea, and then a small, well-centered uh, uh, medial primal condyle lesion. Thank you, Ken, for this uh, interesting case presentation. And now first we start with the live voting. How would you treat this patient? And you have four options. And we would like to open the discussion to the experts. How do you see this case? So who would like to start? Maybe uh, Mats? Ken, I have a question. So yeah. what's the alignment of this patient? Yeah, that's a very good question. I didn't show those pictures, but he had a neutral alignment. There was no varus or valgus. I think he was about one degree valgus. Yes, and this patient was 50 years of age, and the cartilage surrounding uh, the lesion so look fairly... Uh, uh, good. So in this occasion, before at least for the large lesion, I would consider like a Macy. Uh, for the small, smaller lesion, uh, you could always do like a minced cartilage or uh, the type of implants that you are uh, working on the the coral implants as well for this type of size. But for the for the trochlear lesion, which is the really difficult lesion, I would consider a Macy. Yeah, I think I think one of the nice things about this case is that you can really use any of these uh, treatments, I think, effectively, both osteochondral allograft, uh, Macy. In the past, Patroclea and Patella, I've been extremely happy with Macy results, uh, especially when there's not major rel alignment or if we address that. Uh, but in this case, in a patient, uh, this was a uh, patient that already was, uh, you know, diagnosed with early arthritis and is a little harder to get them approved for Macy uh, in the U.S., although sometimes we still can. And therefore, one of the nice things we, which you'll see is that this implant is a lot less expensive and off the shelf. So it's another option. But I think both options would have worked very, very well here. Thank you. If there are no other comments from others, I think we can move along. So here's the intraoperative photos of what we did. We utilize what you see on the far right. It's an Agili C biphasic plug made of aragonite or coral. The bottom phase is the bone phase, which is the natural porosity of the coral. And the top phase has very small drill holes of a very specific diameter that stimulate MSCs to turn into chondroblasts. You can see the picture on the far left is the trochlear lesion and underneath that, the medial promocondyle lesion. You'll see the plugs, they're recessed approximately one to two millimeters below the cartilage line at the level uh, of the subchondral plate. Uh, and you'll also notice something very different than other procedures we do. These never get mastocarded or snowman. They never touch each other because then you'll get joint fluid in between, which will uh, cause a destruction of the uh, implant. Instead, we want bone touching the implant all the way around. And we know from other studies we've presented before at the ICRS that cartilage will fill in the defects in between. So you see here on the trochlea, we have three plugs. 
touching the articular cartilage on the outskirts, but not, and touching bone everywhere else. And we have a central single uh, medial femoral condyle implant in the medial femoral condyle. And on the far right, you can see the x-rays at uh, post-op day one week or two weeks. Here we are at the six months. You can still see some skeleton of the aragonite, but it's starting to disappear. And at 12 months, the bone is turned into complete bone. The aragonite has transformed now into hydroxyapatite. And again, looking at both 24-month and 36-month x-rays, we see very good maintenance of joint line over time in this 50-year-old. In addition, here's the 24-month MRI showing new articular cartilage form and subchondral bone now uh, turning from the aragonite uh, to hydroxyapatite. More importantly, when we look at the KUS scores over a period of time, from baseline, we went from an overall 48.35 um, uh, KUS score to overall score of 97.57 with several 100 scores at the 48-month mark. Pretty amazing uh, for an articular cartilage implant in a patient with KL2 arthritis and uh, multiple large lesions. So why do we use an aragonite uh, scaffold here? Uh, aragonite is derived from coral and inorganic exoskeleton. If you look at electron microscope, like you see at the top, the porosity is almost exactly like bone. It's the first product for cartilage repair approved by the FDA for use on all joint surface lesions, including patients with KL230A. It's biocompatible, biodegradable, has interconnected porosities that allows not only vascularization, but mesenchymal stem cell influx from the host. And it's extremely inexpensive compared to other choices. It's an off-the-shelf biphasic acellular option, costs about one-tenth the price of Macy and about one-third the price of an osteochondral allograft. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank okay. you very much, Ken. So we are at the results voting. How would you treat this patient on your side? And we see that we have a large majority by arthroscopic debridement, PRP arthrologic injection, followed by uh, matrix autologous control site implantation, MACI, and that's the two answers that have been given to us. Thank you. So, Henik, uh, maybe what is your opinion on this um, result? I have no opinion. I have a question to Ken. <laughs> um, so um, it looks like the results are very good. And I wanted to ask you, uh, what do, do you think there could be, uh, or let's say like this, if we make a microfracture, then we have, we have drill, we have holes uh, and they, they will eventually uh, being uh, filled up by bone, right? So we have no more uh, cells they could migrate. Do you think that the scaffold could somehow allow a better migration of the cells from the subchondral bone into the defect to explain the good results? I think they do. And we have two good studies, you know, that were done. We couldn't present it all today, obviously. But Susan, uh, Susan Chubinskaya showed us very clearly uh, in a study where we she took explants of patients who had uh, just died and donated their articular surface of their knee or their ankle. And she cut a donut hole in that cartilage. And we put these implants in, in some, and we put nothing in between. And very quickly, we saw by day 70, actual migration of cells from this disconnected cartilage. So now this is dead cartilage, but it's being kept alive in a, in a, in a uh, cold storage. And the cells will migrate into this acellular implant and not only migrate, but have been proven to make type 2 collagen and matrix. So um, we, we see that the that's why we can put these implants not touching each other and they will fill in the defect because the cartilage seems to migrate. And yes, I do believe that that the um, porosity of the aragonite allows the MSCs to come up from the subchondral surface. So we get cartilage cells that migrate from the periphery, from the cartilage around it, and we get MSCs that come up and turn into cartilage. And what was very nice is in the early GOAT studies, every one of the um, uh, implants, sorry, every one of the histologies was done by an independent lab called NAMSA in Europe, and the independent lab called all of these uh, hyaline cartilage with good subchondral bone and a normal tide mark. So we, we saw some quite remarkable histology, and then that was mimicked in our first two human cases, which we did histology, and the rest we just did MRIs. So there has been a prospective randomized trial of over 250 patients. 
uh, to get the FDA approval. And the con- we had very, very uh, high group of uh, good results, almost 88 to 90 percent. We are unfortunately a bit short in time, so probably we, we need to meet again to address more questions and <laughs> get more answers. But we would like to take some, um, some questions from the audience. And one was about the scaffold. Uh, let me see. What we, and thank you for everybody who was uh, asking us uh, on the on the post. What would be the next strategy for designing scaffold for cartilage defects? Although having the same mechanical properties with the na- with native cartilage is hard. Yeah. So I I think that Sylvia touched upon this quite nicely. I think scaffold. You know, one of the things that we see in a lot of cartilage repair papers or or, or reports is that we never see that true cyto architecture of the collagen, the Benninghoff arcades, for instance, and ways to anchor that. And I think that with uh, some of the um, the electro spinning combined with 3D bioprinting, I think we can make a more uh, robust and more uh, biomimetic approach to uh a scaffold that would re- that would be more uh in line with what we would want that's still the holy grail as she mentioned or you mentioned i'm not sure with regards to scaffold so i think that's imp- very important there was another question about uh, um, biomaterials about the uh, uh, regulatory issues um and uh, of allogenic cartilage And um, uh, this uh, is a little bit country dependent, I think. But um, when I may ask, answer these questions myself, uh, this might, might be a little bit country dependent, but uh, it uh, would nowadays be uh, most probably a medical device class three. Um, yeah, but um, it, there are a lot of allergenic materials uh, on the market and um, it should be feasible. There's another question, I think it's just one minute ago, so I think it's really related to what we just heard. Aragonite source is a big issue. The company the company that uh, did this, there was some very interesting findings. First of all, it turns out we're not using the live coral, we're using the exoskeleton of the dead coral. So as it, it ceases to flower anymore and it's just an exoskeleton, that's what we're using and that's all we need. So there, there has not been a difficult in the sourcing. We have at least already stored away the company that started this in israel it's just recently been bought by an american company but the israeli group have stored probably enough coral for uh, probably the next decade already uh, so there's plenty of plenty of these implants it turns out from a head of coral you can make almost a thousand of these small one centimeter implants so uh, it's inexpensive and, and uh, accessible at this time without having any negative effect on the existing sea flowering sea coral Okay, uh, to wrap up uh, our excellent session today, um, we can say that uh, we think that cells are still more important than their secretome or PRP OEVs to treat osteoarthritis. That for us treatment of osteoarthritis it is uh, especially important uh, to understand more the crosstalk between the cells. Uh, that autocart um, is uh, well accepted even though not uh, completely understood. Scaffolds are important and also the composition and structure, even though um, it uh, seems that it n- must not be exactly the, the uh, matrix of uh, cartilage, hyaline cartilage itself, since also argonite is uh, possible um, from the current perspective. Gene therapy seems to be more and more well accepted, um, but needs to be also further understood and uh, the same is also the case uh, for the growth factors. Thank you very much for this uh, takeaway message, which is really wrapping what we have heard today on a very broad topic. So we would like uh, finally to say also an announcement bonus program by the Owen Foundation, the scientific partner today. Owen Stage Talk, How Biomaterials Take Regenerative Cells to the Wound by John Davis. And we thank you again all for being here. Maybe some words of conclusion also. It was a pleasure to be here. We thank also the studio, all the persons here and all the experts. Thank you for staying with us. And stay tuned for more exciting uh, episodes, probably from the upcoming uh, ICRS, The Wonderful World. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, we consider biomaterials as those materials which are used to replace parts of the appendicular and axial skeleton. They can be metals, polymers, ceramics. And often we classify them as being either bioinert or bioactive. In bone, bioactive generally means that bone has a capacity of bonding to the surface of the material. We know what that mechanism is now. It's a micro-mechanical interdigitation. But today, what I wanted to show you is that bioactive can mean something completely different in bone biomaterials. And I'll demonstrate to you that the material surface can drive the biology in the peri-implant healing compartment, which is at the heart of regeneration. The healing of bone around implants, of course, is embraced in this global term of osseointegration. And to start the story, I'd like to just give you a few highlights of milestones in, the, in this osseointegration story, which I think are particularly important uh, to our understanding today. The first was a paper published by a group down the road in Bern, uh, Danny Buzer and his colleagues back in 1991, where they took six implants, as you see here, they all had different surfaces of different surface roughness, and they came to the conclusion that rough surfaces generated more bone contact with them than smooth surfaces. This was a revolution. This changed the way people started thinking about the surfaces of implants, and everybody started rushing to find a new rough surface to use on their implant surfaces, and many other people, especially in the academic field, tried to figure out ways of actually measuring the roughness of surfaces. But it was also in 1991 that we began to understand the sequence of events where, which happens uh, on a daily basis in all of our bodies where bone is bonding to bone itself. As you sit there listening to me, three to five percent of your skeleton is being eaten away by osteoclasts. But fortunately for most of us, me included, I hope, is that three to 5% of our skeleton is being laid down by osteoclasts. So bone is in the dynamic equilibrium. It started when you were six weeks old in your mother's womb, and it continues till the day you die, or actually slightly after that. So bone is a dynamic living tissue which is undergoing this remodeling uh, all the time, and we began to understand that interface, first described by von Ebner, also not from, from very far away from here, uh, in 1875. That cement line that forms between the new osteonal system that you see in this picture, this is a cross-section of human bone, by the way, this is a human digit. Uh, one of my graduate students doesn't talk to me anymore as a result. No, that's not true, okay. Um, but nevertheless, we began to understand how that cement line was formed, first by the secretion of non collagenous proteins, their mineralization with calcium phosphate crystals, the crystal growth that occurs in that non collagenous matrix, and then, of course, the secretion of collagen after that to build up the mass of bone. So we understand, we understood in 1991 what that sequence was, or began to understand it at least. The other thing that happened a little bit later in 2005 is that this concept of the difference between primary stability and st secondary stability set in by, from this paper by Raghavandra and their colleagues. In this, what they recommend, they, they, they describe is, of course, if you put an implant in bone, it doesn't matter whether it's an orth orthopedic implant or a dental implant, the fact is that the initial friction fit of that implant will keep that implant stably in place. But the bone around the implant dies as a result of your osteotomy, as a result of your surgery. But fortunately, new bone starts forming and that primary stability as it's lost because of the death of bone around the implant is replaced by secondary stability, which is the uh, responsibility of the growth of new bone. And that secondary stability therefore becomes a very important part of the story of osteointegration. And that secondary stability itself can be split up into three different phases. The lag phase, which is, of course, the healing phase before any 
osteoblasts get anywhere close to the implant surface, the growth phase, which is the actual growth of bone on the surface of the implant, and eventually you reach a plateau in the sinusoidal curve, uh, which is where there's remodeling going on around the implant, new bone forming around the implant. In fact, you've, you've reached the homeostasis, uh, which you have in your natural bone. So happens that these three phases correspond uh, exactly to three biological phenomena which we can test experimentally. The phenomenon of osteoconduction, bone formation itself, and as I've mentioned now a couple of times, bone remodeling. What's osteoconduction? Well, in the orthopedic field, osteoconduction was first described as the growth of bone on an old bone surface at a fracture site. That was a histological def definition. It doesn't give you any idea of how it happens. And we re re redefined osteoconduction um, a few years ago as the, uh, at a cellular level as the recruitment and migration of osteogenic cells to the implant surface. And by the way, it could be the implant surface, but it could be the old bone surface happening right now in your body at one of those remodeling sites. So osteoconduction is a very important part of the whole story of secondary stability. And nowhere is it more important than in trabecular bone healing. As you can see in this picture, um, these green cells, they're obviously Irish in this case, um, these Irish mesenchymal progenitors, I'll call them, are going to be migrating through the interstices of the marrow cavity and between the trabeculae of the bone to the implant surface where they can ma uh, mature, they can become secretorily active and lay down bone on the surface of the material. This is seen not just in cartoons, but it's seen in histology. This is some of the histology from Peter Schubach, one of the premier histologists in this field who lives just down the road with his lab overlooking the lake um, uh, 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 Zurich, uh, just a few kilometers away. So here's a tongue of bone, which you can see growing around the implant surface. And at his magn uh, blow up magnification picture here, you can see that that's the, the growth of the bone on the surface is happening because those cells are actually coming to the surface of the implant in advance of the tongue of bone. And those cells we know come from a so, uh, perivascular origin. So you've got blood vessels in the wound site and you've got perivascular cells and they uh, migrate to the surface of the implant uh, following platelet activation. So here they are, they're migrating away from the implants, uh, the, the vascular surface down to the implant surface. And you see as a result, they're becoming uh, uh, polarized, secretorily active on the implant surface, laying down bone, and you get a seam of bone apparently spreading over the surface of the material only because of the continued migration and recruitment of these cells to the implant surface. So this process of contact osteogenesis relies on osteoconduction, but it begs the question, well, where do they come from? I've told you they're perivascular cells, but why? And why do the vessels come into the wound itself? And all of that biology is happening in that lag phase that I told you about. And essentially, we knew nothing about it. This was a mystery. It was less than a mystery because nobody had even thought about it. So we recently designed some experiments to examine this aspect of healing. And what you see here, this cruciate implant, which is only four millimeters in diameter, is small enough to put in a, the skull of a mouse. So we create an, uh, an osteotomy with a trephine, four millimeter trephine in the skull of a mouse. We can place this implant, and there you see it placed in the skull of a mouse. And in the cartoon here, you see that it's covered with a glass cover slip so that we can take that mouse and it, uh, with its head, a live mouse, and put it under the microscope and see what's happening in those four healing volumes uh, of the cruciate implant. And then we can take the mouse back to its cage and leave it there for a couple of days, and then take it back to the microscope again and look at it, and look at exactly the same healing volume in the same mouse and see what's changed. Now in this experiment, and I want, this is the important part, in this experiment, the only variable is the surface of the implant. 
the implants are titanium, commercially pure titanium, standard stuff. And either one is machined, as you see here, or the other one has a nanostructured surface. So one is relatively smooth, and one is really quite complex at the nanoscale. Now, we'd never done this before, and we'd never used these implants before, and we'd never used this cranial window model before, so we had to first find out whether the model was working, and we'd expect bone to be growing on a nanosurface more effectively than a machine surface. We know that there's a distinction between distance and, uh, and contact osteogenesis, and on a nanosurface, we'd expect to see contact osteogenesis. On a machine surface, we'd expect to see distance osteogenesis, and that's exactly what happened. So here's micro CT images of distance osteogenesis on the machine surface. And you can clearly see on the nano surface, there's a tongue of bone growing around in contact with the implant surface. So the nano surface is generating contact osteogenesis. And as can be expected, that can be measured as the BIC or the bone to implant contact. And it's vastly greater on the nano surface than it is on the machine surface. Okay, so the model's working. That's all I'm telling. But that's not what we were trying to do. We were trying to look at what happens before bone grows. And remember, as I said, we can take the mouse every other day or whatever it is and put it, the mouse's head under the microscope and look at what's happening. Now, how can we look at what's happening beforehand? Well, one of the things is what we wanted to do is look at uh, those vessels which are growing into the wound site. So what we do when we've got the mouse under the microscope, we inject some fluorescent dye into its tail vein, so it suffuses the whole vascular system, and the, the vessels light up in the skull, and the skull is under the microscope so we can have to see it in real time. And every time we take the, 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 uh, the uh, animal back to its uh, cage again and take it to the microscope, we do the same thing again. So immediately we saw a difference. At day seven, you can see the pictures yourself, there's a vast difference in the vasculature around the machine surface and the nanosurface. The nanosurface is generating far more blood vessels. By 28 days, that vasculature has become patterned around the nanosurface to produce this beautiful radial array, uh, array of mature vessels, compared to the machine surface where the, the, the organization of that vasculature is still very higgledy-piggledy. But we wanted to look more, more than just the vasculature. We wanted to also look at the uh, mesenchymal progenitor cells, those cells which have to migrate into the wound site. And to do that, we used another mouse, a genetically modified mouse, where the mesenchymal progenitors are labeled with TD tomato. They're red. Uh, you see them in this picture first. And what we also saw at higher magnification is that those cells are coming into the wound site with the vasculature. They only occur in, in the presence of the vasculature, but you can see that they're not in contact with the vessels. These are not pericytes. I'll say that again. These progenitor cells are not pericytes. They are perivascular cells, and there's a very distinct difference because these cells do differentiate in time into pericytes, and that was, that's what you're seeing in this picture, where they're wrapping around the vessels now, as you saw in a previous talk, and they're controlling the architecture of those vessels. They're also becoming osteocytes, which is what you see in the smaller picture as well. But to finish off, the fascinating observation that we made in this work was that those mesenchymal progenitors not only come into the wound site with the vasculature, but there is a proliferative bloom of these cells during the early phase of healing. And so what you're seeing now is two strips of pictures, each from the same mouse. One was from a, a mouse with a nano implant, one from a mouse with a machined implant. And you can see with a nano implant, there's a vast proliferation of these cells, which dies out, not completely, because some of these cells become differentiated and become pericytes and osteocytes, etc. But during healing, there's that bloom of uh, proliferation. On the machine surface, there's very much less. Remember, the only variable in this experiment is the surface of the biomaterial. So the surface of the biomaterial is driving this essential biology, allowing this wound to heal. But I'll leave you with one question. Why the bloom? Why, is it, why are these cells re seemingly redundant? 
Well, we know that during uh, immediately after surgery, there's an acute inflammatory response. We know that during that time of inflammation, phagocytic, phagocytic macrophages are really important. But in time, if everything goes well, they translate into reparative macrophages or M2-type macrophages. It may be, this is hypothesis, it may be that these cells are creating this bloom because they're changing the environment to allow that transition from acute inflammation to repar reparative tissue um, in that normal healing process. And of course, we have to ask, does this happen in everybody? Does it happen in healthy individuals? Now we have a model to look at it. And so this gives us new targets to look at the biology, very early biology of peri-implant healing, which will enable us to design new surfaces which are much more efficient than the ones we've got today. Thanks very much.